Hello and welcome back to The Effect. Uh, we're moving on from difference and differences to now talk about an entirely different class of approaches to causal inference. Uh, so far, the methods that we've been talking about, you know, controlling for variables in regression or matching, uh, you know, doing fixed effects or event studies or, or uh, difference and differences, all of these things are about finding ways to measure things that are on the back door and control for them, get rid of that variation by finding it and cutting it out. Uh, however, that is not the only approach that we can take to causal inference. Uh, and uh, you might recall back in the, you know, finding front doors chapter, there was a lot of stuff about not sort of closing back doors as you find them, but rather just isolating the front door path and that you want to find in the first place. Uh, sort of like you might do in a randomized controlled experiment. In a randomized controlled experiment, what do you do? Well, you uh, say, hey, I'm just going to take some of the data, I'm gonna randomize within that data, and then in that particular kind of data, I know that the only path that exists is the front door path that I'm interested in. I don't need to worry about controlling away all the back doors because I have selected a part of the data in which there is only a front door path in my randomized sample. You can sort of think of this as analogous to like, you're making a statue. There's two different main ways you can make a statue. You can find a big old chunk of marble or wood or whatever, and you can carve away at it, or you can whittle it or whatever until you find the statue that is within. That's like you're whittling away all those back doors until you find just the variation sitting at the center that you think has a causal relationship interpretation. You've identified the effect. You found the statue. The other way you can do things is just have a mold and pour some molten iron or whatever uh, into your mold and the exact shape that you want comes straight out. There's only one way that you can get the thing that you want because you are only allowing the variation in there that has the exact shape that you want it to have. That is a form of finding a front door. So aside from doing a randomized controlled experiment, which would be great, but you can't always do, what is a common way of trying to find a front door? Well, that brings us to instrumental variables. Instrumental variables is basically the exact same idea as running a randomized controlled experiment, except that we do not actually get to randomize it or control it. Uh, we are looking for a form of randomization that exists in the broader world, and then we are going to isolate that statistically, uh, then that's going to give us our causal effect of interest. So let's take as a quick example an actual randomized experiment so that you can see that this really is the exact same idea. So let's say that we are running a randomized controlled experiment uh, where we are assigning people to either get a drug or not get a drug. However, people don't always do what you tell them. Uh, so sometimes people will take the drug that you tell them to take. Sometimes people will you know, say, hey, you told me to take this drug, but nah, I don't feel like it, or I forgot, or whatever. And so they don't always take the drug. And also some people maybe who you assign not to take the drug, maybe they find their way to get it as well. They're like, hey, you're running this trial about this drug that you think might cure my disease. I'll go find my own way to get this drug, right? So not everybody does what you say. So in a ran this randomized controlled trial, uh, you say, well, I've got this source of randomization. I randomly assigned you to either get the treatment or not, All right? So there is some form of randomization. This is what we might call an exogenous variable, a source of exogenous variation. Exogenous in the context of uh, causal inference is basically saying that it is as good as random. In the system that we are looking at, uh, it doesn't really have any relationship between this source of randomization and there's no back doors from it to your outcome variable. So it might as well be random, right? It's not actually random uh, necessarily. Uh, in this case it is because we randomized it, but it doesn't have to be, right? It is a source of exogenous variation that sort of comes from outside the system. There's some outside randomizing pressure that leads you to either get the treatment or not. Now in this experiment, we have a source of exogenous variation, the random assignment to either get the drug or not. But we also have a separate thing, which is whether you actually got the drug or not. So we have a, uh, this, this drug, whether you took it or not, which is not random, right? Because people chose whether to follow the instructions that they were given or not. However, the random assignment to get the drug or not should have an impact on that treatment. Right? So it is an instrumental variable for treatment. The random assignment is an instrumental variable for treatment. Part of it is randomly assigned. We have this sort of random assigned treatment to either get the treatment or not, uh, and that sort of pushes you in one direction or the other, even if it doesn't determine it perfectly. So the treatment is not completely randomly assigned, but there is a form of random assignment that takes part in determining the treatment. And if we can isolate just that part, uh, then we can say that we have found the random part of assignment. Uh, and by focusing in just on that, we can get the causal effect without having to worry about any back doors because in the part of the data that we have isolated, there is random assignment that we can look at. So how does this actually work? Well, it's sort of like the opposite of controlling for a variable. When we wanna control for a variable, we say, hey, there's a back door between the treatment that we have and the outcome. There's some alternate explanation of why these two things might go together that, that does not reflect my causal explanation of interest. In the case of an instrumental variable, I have a source of random assignment to your treatment. 
And so that is the only source of variation that I want to isolate. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing that I would do with a control variable, except backwards. I'm gonna see what I can predict with the randomized variable, with my, my instrumental variable, and I'm gonna get rid of all the other variation. Unlike with a control variable, I see what I can predict with my control variable and I subtract that out. This time I'm gonna see what I can predict with my instrumental variable and just keep that. Here are some graphs that demonstrate how this works. So in this case, we've got a treatment X, a continuous treatment. Uh, we also have a continuous outcome Y. I wanna know the effect of X on Y. And I have an instrumental variable Z uh, that in this case, for simplicity's sake, only takes two values, zero and one, it is binary. And let's say that Z is effectively randomized. It's a source of exogenous variation. It's completely unrelated to Y. It's from outside the system, except for the fact that it helps determine how much treatment X you get. So if we look at the raw data, we can see that there is a relationship between X and Y, but it's sort of a random cloud. There's not a whole lot going on there. Uh, but we can also see that, you know, the, the clusters for Z equals zero and Z equals one are not really overlapping. We have some of those blank circles over there to the bottom right and some uh, solid circles to the top left. So clearly Z is related to X uh, in that the Z values of uh, with the blanks tend to be a little bit further to the right. The Z values with the solids tend to be a little bit further to the left. Uh, and it also seems to be related to Y, but we're hoping that our assumption is that it's only related to Y because it helps you get more or less treatment X. So what can we do to get our instrumental variables estimate? Well, the first thing that we do is we're going to do, again, the exact same thing that we do with a control variable. We're going to predict X using Z. So we're gonna get our average X for Z equals one and our average X for Z equals zero. And that gives us two different predictions for the two different parts of the data that are either uh, have a Z of one or have a Z of zero. But then unlike doing a control variable, we are only gonna use the predicted variation. If we're controlling for Z, we would subtract out all of the things that we just predicted. This time we're gonna subtract out everything we didn't just predict. So all that variation in the data collapses down to be just what we would predict with our Z. And since we only have two values of Z, we only get two predictions here, the average of X for Z equals one and the average of X for Z equals zero. Then we're gonna do the exact same thing with Y. We're gonna see what part of Y we can predict with Z. Uh, we're gonna predict with Z equals one and B equals zero. Again, since we only have two values, we're just getting the average Y for Z equals one and the average Y for Z equals zero. And then we will collapse everything down to just those two points. So now I have variation in X as predicted by Z. I have variation in Y as predicted by Z. And since I think that Z is a source of random variation, I'm gonna say that the variation that I have left here is basically randomly assigned. It is randomly assigned whether you end up in that uh, Z equals one group or the Z equals zero group. And therefore the change in X that we see is random. And therefore the change in Y that we see is also randomly determined by your treatment X. So if I draw a line between those two points, that shows me the relationship between the random part of X and the random part of Y. This is the relationship that I get that has a causal interpretation. I can say that this reflects the effect of X on Y. By increasing X from that first value to the second value, I decrease Y from that first value to that second value. Therefore I can say that X decreases Y causally. Now of course for all of this to work, there are some assumptions that need to be in place. The two big ones are called relevance and validity. Relevance just says that in the step where we are using Z to predict X, there's actually some good prediction going on. Z is actually a good predictor of X. It doesn't matter if Z is an actually randomized variable if it doesn't determine X in any way. When I'm isolating just the part of X that I have explained with Z, well, there better be some variation left in there. Uh, if, it does, if Z doesn't really do anything to tell me what your value of X is, then there's simply no variation left to study. So it needs to be the case that Z is actually a good predictor of X. That is the relevance condition. In addition, and the more difficult one, and we'll have another video on this later, is the validity assumption. Validity is saying basically that Z is indeed a source of exogenous variation. Uh, that Z is randomly assigned in some way, or at least it's randomly assigned after we add some other control variables that account for any backdoors between Z and the outcome. So this validity assumption make clear that, you know, we still have to worry about backdoors, right? Instrumental variables is not a completely, you know, get out of jail free kind of card. Uh, it just moves the assumption about all your backdoors being closed from a tr tricky variable, your treatment variable, to one that is perhaps a bit easier the instrument. So you still need to be able to make the claim that, yeah, either there are no backdoors between Z and the outcome, indeed, in other words, Z is actually randomly assigned as it would be in our random drug trial, or at least uh, that we understand the determinants of Z well enough that we can actually measure and control for all the things necessary to close all the backdoors between Z and the outcome so that Z is exogenous, that it is effectively as good as random. It is a source of random variation in our treatment. If we have a source of random variation, like we do in a randomized controlled trial, or like we hope we can find in the world using our instrumental variable, then we can get the effect of X on Y, 
just like it's a randomized controlled experiment, because that's effectively what we are finding. That is what we are doing with instrumental variables. We are finding a source of exogenous variation in our treatment. If we can find a source of exogenous variation in our treatment, whether we generated it in a randomized controlled experiment or we found it in the world in some treatment that happens to at least some of the time be randomly assigned in some way, then we can isolate the effect of X on Y using instrumental variables. The actual details of how we can do that, I'm going to cover in some of the next videos. Thank you. Thank <music> you.